Hey everyone, it's Andy Kushner, host of The Wedding Biz, in which I conduct in-depth and revealing interviews of icons and those who I feel are the next generation icons of the weddings and event industry. And I'm recording this only a few days after returning from yet another Engage conference. This one held at Nizuk in Cancun, Mexico. And wow, was that an experience. I really, really appreciated those of you who introduced yourselves to me both in and out of the media lounge. To hear the impact that this show is having is fuel for me to keep going and take this to higher and higher levels. I was also fortunate to conduct some very inspiring interviews while there, including Bruce Russell, a wonderful planner and designer out of London, and also Tara Fay, a planner and designer out of Ireland. And both Bruce and Tara have a successful TV show as well called My Big Day, Home or Away, which they each talk about. And I also had a second interview with none other than photographer extraordinary Jose Villa. Um, Jose talked about shooting Nick Jonas and Priyanka's wedding, also Justin Bieber and Haley Baldwin and more. That was quite an interview. I also had the first of what you're going to discover is a series of roundtable sessions. And this one was to discuss the takeaways from Engage. And this was toward the end of Engage. And I sat down with designer Rishi Patel who has been on the show before, great designer, also travel and weddings director at Harper's Bazaar, Carrie Goldberg, who's also been on the show, and the number one adjacent of David Beam, Christina Matucci, who has been on the show before. And yes, quite a dynamic panel, as you can imagine with those three. We had a blast. I'll be releasing that really soon, or maybe I just did last week. I'm not quite sure of the order of this yet. Um, I want to mention last week's episode, if you missed it. Um, it was before the holidays. It was Reem Aradaki and Greg Fink. Reem is a major bridal gown designer out of Paris, and Greg Fink is a photographer also out of Paris who was on The Wedding Biz and who is also Reem's fiancé and general manager. So that was a, a great interview. Loved having Reem on the show and Greg again. And so now it is time to announce today's guest, and that is Clayne Gessel, an award-winning international photographer. Clayne's images have been featured in dozens of magazines, including PDN, National Geographic, and Smithsonian. Clayne was also inducted into all of the National Geographic fine art galleries across the world. Yes, for real. However, more than that, what this is also about is how his life experience has informed him to be capable of truly understanding his clients and capturing the essence of who they are, what their relationship is, and doing this in one single shot, which you're going to learn more about. And I also want to thank Klain for letting himself be really vulnerable with me and therefore with all of you listening to the show. Um, Klain's story is, is really remarkable, and we go deep behind who he really is, why he does what he does, and how he does what he does. So enjoy my conversation with Klain Gessel. Klain, it is so much fun to have you on the show. I mean, I you know I met you at Engage a couple yeah. of years ago, something like that. Yeah. You know, heard great things about your work, and when I look at your work, to me they are stunning pieces of art. I don't look at them as photos. I look at them as pieces of art. Thank you so much. There are many, many amazing artists out there. I'm honored that you thought of me as one of them. Well, I, and I would love to know, you, you have, I know there's some history in your childhood. I, I'm, I'm dying to hear about this. First of all, where are you from? Where'd you grow up? I grew up outside of Seattle. Out of Seattle? Yeah. Because all along, I'm thinking you're in the Northeast or something like that. No, Northwest, Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Was there anything back then that started to hint at what you would be doing now in terms of your interest in photography? Growing up in Seattle, there was a, a big artist bloom in general in the Northwest. A lot of it was with music, as you know. Most of the 90s grunge rock yeah, came out sure. of Seattle. Nirvana, That's all those groups. Oh, yeah. They were great. But my inspiration actually started to come from music. Um, that's where my inspiration for photography first started was with the music How industry. So? What do you mean? Understanding that when you're feeling an emotion, mm-hmm. it's the same in your hypothalamus. It's the same dopamine hit that you get when you're looking at an image, when you're experiencing other things. So a lot of ways it speaks to you when you're looking at a, looking at an image, the same thing that you feel when you're, you know, hear a song that's reminiscent, hmm. brings you back to that time, right? We've all listened to a song and then you go back to when you heard it last, yeah. when you were driving down the highway or whatever else, same exact thing with a photo. But when did it hit you, you know, the spark of passion for, for photography as the vehicle for expressing that? 
that was after high school. I am completely self-taught, never taken a class, not even in college. And it was after that, that I wanted to get into the art field. Why? Why, why did that? I felt like I saw things differently, being able to, to capture things in a way that nobody else could. And hopefully that comes through even today, hopefully. But I, you know, a lot of people say that, I'm sure. But being able to see things a little differently, mm-hmm. it's more about sharing. I feel like an artist exposes their vulnerabilities at the same time as they're trying to heal them. Oh, that's interesting. That makes sense. Well, but you know, I love when you say that because when I think about the art, the musicians I I love, you know, and then when you think about painters and all of that, the ones who are the most vulnerable and who could really be out there with their struggles, their turmoil and their love and all of that, we are are drawn to that, right, right? As humans, because I think we're struggling to let that out and feel it. It's almost like they're doing it for us. Right. And in a lot of ways growing up with my personal things, I had a lot going on. I love to express the love of other people because it was something that I didn't feel like was happening in my own life. Like in your family, basically? Uh, family and then Abortion. personal life into my 20s. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Single. I wouldn't think that about you. I would oh, think my you're gosh. very outgoing and no. No, constantly being able to give your couple something that you wish you could have. This is very personal. Oh, interesting. <laughs> but Yes, that, that was a lot of it. And it's the same thing with music, right? That's where a lot of the inspiration for music comes from, is being able to share how you feel with other people. And the only way I knew how to do that through photography was by trying to give them something that I couldn't have myself. You know what? No, no, I get this because, I mean, for me, it was years later having a ton of therapy. I've been very open yes, about that. I, therapy I wish, is so great. I wish everybody had therapy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know? absolutely. It's like another yes. language, you know, but but it's such a wonderful way to really understand yourself. And, and there's so much more power. I don't mean over other people, but self-power, empowerment. Um, but until I had that understanding, I was so passionate about music. You know, it, everyone knows I talk on the podcast. It, it just slammed me in the face when I was six. And I realized being able to express emotion with an instrument, I I couldn't do it nearly as well otherwise. Absolutely. And it's, it's life is about balance. Art is about balance, right? And people that, that can take the brightest, greatest photos have a deep, dark back behind it. It's true. You know, it's true. It's the same with music. Well, great actors and actresses, we hear about that, right? And the great musicians. It comes from somewhere. The ability to shine, to see the fruit of the tree, how wide the branches go, you have to have deep, deep roots to hold those branches out wide. Hmm. So it's the same thing with photography. It's the same thing with all art. You have to be able to understand the juxtaposed version of that. If it's light, it's dark. If it's happy, it's sad. That's why some of the best comedians are the most depressed people you'll ever meet. That's right. It's true. Well, that's well known. Almost every comedian has some kind of a real dark past. Well, you've been open with it. So so I'm going to ask on the microphone, there was a point you were living out of your car. Yes. When was this in your... Yeah. After, After high school, went out on my own and uh, went on your own to do what went out on my own so i grew up very oh, you mean leaving home and leaving home i grew up very religious it's a story really where i left a religion i grew up mormon oh. and i left the religion when i turned 18 19 and my whole circle of friends my whole life everything i knew in the pacific northwest family included family too family included weren't talking to me so i had i had nothing so i I quit my job. Can I stop for a second, though? What is it that drove you? Because this is like who you are yeah. to be able to have the courage to do something like that and to know. And you must have known family and friends would turn their backs on you. Yeah. Without getting too personal, a lot of this is the reason that drove me into photography, into love, uh-huh. is because it was something I felt that was it, it was not even like not lacking. It just wasn't there. It was just a big hole mm. in my life. I didn't have anybody to talk to. I didn't have anybody to share anything with. Mm. It was a really, really dark time in my life. So I got in my car and I started driving and I was living out of my car. A lot of my time was spent in warmer climates, obviously. (laughs) I hope so. So like Southern California, Arizona, Utah, in the desert and living out of my car for eight months, nine months. And I I decided, you know, I really need to get myself together. Applied to college back in Washington State where I had residency and Mm -hmm. I got accepted and moved back uh, to Western Washington University at the time. And then after a quarter, I transferred to the University of Washington where I finished my degree. And what was your degree in? Communications, business. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's, what were you thinking of doing at that time before you thought of photography? No idea, but I knew I didn't want to live in my car anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. You're making me think, what is that? that there, there's that film, this is so off topic, but uh, the guy who climbs uh, cliffs by his fingertips oh, and yeah. lives out of Free the van. Solo yeah, yeah. And yeah, at yeah. this point, he's probably making seven figures with spon- oh, or with sponsorships and doors, but yeah. he still lives that way. Yeah. 
You know, it's 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 like a romanticized kind of a thing. But it I know was a it's- fun life, the, more so than the life itself. It was the lack of closeness that I miss, the mm. lack of people. There yeah. were there were weeks and sometimes months where I would go without talking to somebody months. that I know. Yeah, wow. absolutely. When you're kind of ostracized from a community. You you can't go back. There's not a choice. And so I had to start a new life. And it took a long time for me to push the reset button and figure out kind of what I wanted to do. And that's where I propelled into art because there's really, that's the best way to express yourself in a way that you can relate to other people. What aspect of art? We're talking photography, photography. or something else? Yeah, photography. photography. So, and you say you're self-taught. So what, what were the first steps that you, uh, well, first of all, all right, so let's back up. You're going to college to get this degree in communications. Mm-hmm. You don't know what you're going to do. You've had this experience, like you say, of living in the car. And so certainly you're thinking about making a living, earning a living. You're not sure what to do. What happens when you graduate college? I, at the time I was shooting at the Seattle Times. So I was there. Uh, so I had a relatively stable job. Not really. It was more of an internship that turned into something where Mm -hmm. they allowed me to stay. So I wasn't making a lot of money. I was my studio. Oh my God. I wish you could see the studio in Seattle on university district across the street from a Jack in the box. It was (laughs) anyway, how I decided to go from college into photography was really simple. I didn't see it as an option to do anything else. If that makes sense. Yeah. Like what what else? I sure. I understand. So what was your first step? The first step is kind of accepting the outside world to be the, exactly the way it is. I don't know if I understand what, if that, this what you makes mean by sense. That. No, go for it. I love this. I feel like a lot of people live in a world where their expectations are not, they're not com- in complete alignment with yes. how they feel. And I feel like right. your life is exactly how you allow it to be. Hmm. Right. If you're unhappy with your life, well, you kind of allow it to be that way. And of course, there are exceptions to this rule. Of course, there are people that aren't able to do certain things, and mm-hmm. I don't mean to talk about them. But for the most part, if you're healthy and you're you're happy and you have the ability to do something, then you can change the situation that you're in. But you have to do that by accepting things exactly how they are, so that you can take accountability and ownership of those things, mm. and then start to change them. This is the tenets of therapy. This is the bottom line. For yeah, it. taking responsibility. Taking responsibility. Step one. Step one, but also living now kind of like meditation Hmm. but not really where you're not thinking so much about the future you're not thinking so much about the past because thinking about the present or past can bring unhappiness or anxiety Hmm. more so just thinking about the moment that you're in and what you can do to further the next moment that you'll be in yeah well you're talking about the ultimate challenge really being in the present yeah yeah, it's it's difficult to do, but through that, very difficult. I was able to escape a lot of the sadness that I had felt uh, from a lack in my family and the camaraderie that there were years I didn't speak to my parents. Yeah. And it, that was really, really hard because they were the only people left from my prior life in the church that mm. really, that I wanted to be in my life. Yeah, sure. And so filling that gap, it kind of forced me at a younger age, early 20s to to focus that it's difficult because you have to be vulnerable. You have to understand vulnerability to understand art. That's what it is. And you're yes. putting yourself out there yeah. and you're saying, this is what I, this is what I want. This is the essence of love. And I know it because I felt the lack of yes. it. Right. Yes. And there have been years where I had nobody to talk to, no, no soulmate, nobody to, to feel the things that my couples feel. So mm. for me to be able to gift that to them. Right. That is the most the the greatest honor I could ask for, regardless of regardless of the the actual job, right? Regardless of getting paid, this is for me is a duty to be able to say, look, I can see things a certain way because I felt things in a way that nobody's felt before. You know, not a lot of people that understand c- camera and lighting and photography and fine art and mm-hmm. landscapes and all this stuff. But also being able to give that to them is really really unique. Well, you know, I'm I'm also thinking again, you're. Your photos are screaming with them in a positive way with emotionality, you know, really great. And I, you know, I look at them and I, I, I don't really know the couples who you're shooting. Obviously, I don't really know them, but I get this feeling. I mean, it, I, I feel like you're able to capture that because of your ability to have felt vulnerable. Thank you so much. I can't tell you how much that means to me because that is you connecting with me and yeah. me being able to convey how I feel or felt to you. Yeah. As a, as a viewer of the image, I feel like the best photography conveys an image. You, you're able to command not only what the people see or where they look in the image, but how mm. they feel. 
that's a really good photographer when you can do that. And I, not to say that I'm great at all, but, but to be able to connect, that's the goal to connect with people. I love this. I want to ask too, you know, when I was kind of looking through various things, website, whatever I found on the internet about you, there's a quote, it's a bit long, but I want to read it and see what you think more about it. You said, the most important thing for me when approaching a wedding is to try to understand what the experience will be for the couple, how they see their big day and what makes their love special. Understanding the little things between them and their personalities Help me capture that every step of the way. It's why we offer, well, a complimentary engagement shoot. But in terms of the heart of that, to understand what the experience will be for the couple. And again, we're going to the heart of it. Absolutely. You have to know how they get along, their vulnerabilities, how they love, how they interact, because kissing photos don't work for every couple. I've had a lot of couples that don't like PDA. They don't really kiss. They just, they're in love, but it's a very different kind of love. Oh, interesting. Really being able to get inside their head takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. But if you want to create artwork, that's what it takes. So in order to get there, first, we talk about connection. You've got to connect with the couple. How do you go about doing that? I mean, do you have some particular, not that there's a formula, but any particular way that you go about getting to know them so that you can get to that point of vulnerability? That is a great question. Yes. When we meet them, when we interview them, I prefer face-to-face in person so I can get a really good feel that way. We have them fill out a questionnaire. I want to interview them as much as they're interviewing me just to make sure that I can get them what they're looking for. Mm. And I want to make sure that what they're looking for is the essence photo, right? The one shot, the shot that, that they're looking for is a shot that they want to hang on their wall. I think any good relationship, whether it's with a couple, your spouse, business partner, is just about setting and managing correct expectations. Yeah. If you go into this and say, look, I can do this and this and this, but I can't do this, this, or this, and just lay it out there on the table, then they get to decide from there. And you also want to decide when you're meeting with them if you want to work with them, if you want to capture their love, if you feel like you have a connection with them. Because yeah. in a way, being at, they're at their wedding day, you are spending more time with the bride or the groom. That's right. Then they are than with their each spouse. Other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in a lot of ways, you have to really understand that couple and be able to to reach in deep and understand their vulnerabilities as well, because those are the things that you translate, right? You translate yeah. the darks to get the whites. It's mm. just like a carbon paper. When you're scratching on the carbon paper and you're trying to trying to get something that's underneath and you take the pencil out and you that's scrape right. on it. This is old school you're talking this about. This <laughs> is it. But this is how you create insane images is you understand their hurts so you can bring those to light. Not their hurts necessarily, but you understand every part about them, right? Yeah. You have to connect with them on a, on a level that's vulnerable, on the level that they're healing, the level that they come together. Because you and I both know the best marriages are not about, oh, we're in love. We're, we're so, you know, it's about, hey, this person can work through my shit oh, with yeah. me. Oh, this hell person yeah. can get deep with me. That's what I need. This is love. This That's is right. marriage because they're going to stick by me. They know my sores. They know my sad spots. They know all this stuff. That's the depth. Those are the roots. And when you understand these things about these people, you can truly bring them to light. You can understand their their self-consciousness. You can understand everything about them. Do you run though into situations where the couples are just not able to go there? Not anymore. <laughs> yeah. My first 10 years, absolutely, because I wasn't able to pick. You have to, you know, it's a Ah. career, it's a job. As you get a little, you grow a little bit more, you're able to select your couples. I'm pretty selective about who I take and and who I work with because I want to be sure that they understand what I do because this is more than a, I have a studio and they're amazing and they capture the day, they get the start, the finish the dancing, the shoes, the ring, the, the bridesmaids, right. but capturing the essence of the wedding in one photo, to me, that's fine art. That's truly taking it to the next level, giving the couple a piece of art, the one picture that they hang on their wall. You don't need 30,000 pictures on your wall. You need one photo on your wall that captures the essence of who you are and the essence of your day. That's where I come in. Mm. People may not understand, um, not if they don't know your work, what you mean by one shot. Sure. Sure. Happy to explain. So I've had some work with National Geographic. Mm-hmm. I shot the cover. I'm in National Geographic. Yeah, by the way, another more blow away shots. I Thank just want to say, yeah, but go ahead. Thank I you. Hopefully when you look at the, the photos also in the National Geographic fine art galleries all across the yeah, world. Amazing. So it's everywhere. But hopefully when you look at that photo, what you're seeing is the essence of all hope, all beauty, all light that you can see within this area, which is called Patagonia. It's in uh, South, South America. Mm-hmm. 
But when you're looking at the image, the hope is that this is the most beautiful place because it encapsulates the beauty in one shot. So taking that over to weddings, taking the, the light, the love that I have for this place, translating that into a living, breathing event that turns into a wedding. Yes. That's art. That's fine art. And trying to get that and enca- encapsulate it into one shot can be really difficult. We try and oh, get that I can't for even every imagine. couple. I don't even know. If I could only follow you around to see this, I, I can't imagine. Do you feel pressure? I mean, you're, you're talking, again, so people understand, so I understand, your studio is getting the regular shots that everyone wants, but you are there to end up with one single shot for them in the end. Typically, typically, yeah. So we capture everything. Let's, sure. you know, just just to be fair, everything gets gets captured, but I'll typically show up and scout the area out of where the couple is, where the ceremony is, where the reception is. And the area that they chose to get married, a lot of my weddings are destination. I've shot all over the mm-hmm. world. I've been to 55 yep. countries. Mm-hmm. So a lot of this is finding just the right spot that encapsulates their love along with the environment. And hopefully you can see that when you're looking at the images, but also understanding light. That comes from my fine art landscape background, uh, yeah. understanding, look, we're going to have to get up early to get the shot. I have the shot from Iceland. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's, it's the mountain range in the background. I get asked all the time if it's superimposed. We got up at 6 a.m. Oh, I know which one you're talking about. Is it like a canyon? Yeah, that you're, mountain, yeah, 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 yeah. I've seen that. We get, we get asked all the time, my, me and my couple, <laughs> if it's fake, 100% real. We just had to, <laughs> right. we had to work to get that photo. And I, I was there a few days early and I said, look, I can get you this photo, uh, but this is what you're going to have to do to do it. Yeah. This is the price to pay. And if you're willing to pay that price, I can, I yeah. can translate that and that for hike you. out there to that ledge yeah you can't imagine oh yeah where were you shooting that i mean we'll have to have that in the show notes so yeah. people can look and see what we're talking about how did you i don't understand where were you and the distance and a few hundred the, yards away i typically go like i said earlier i do mostly destinations so i'll go a few days early yeah. to these wedding locations and i'll scout out i have to look at time of day because even if you're on the Almafi coast where the sun comes up in June is different than August. It's different than se- September yes, and it's different right. than December. Right. So understanding where the right angle is, but also where the light is at that angle, it's super important. So I always go out early and then I can present the couple the day before the wedding with an image. And I say, look, this is what I can get you with, um, you know, and I'm going to put you here. This is how we're going to position it. But this is what I need from you. This is my ask. Can mm-hmm. you do this for me? I promise you that if you do, it will be worth it because this is the one shot yeah. that you get to hang on your wall forever that differentiates you from all the other weddings yes. that were shot at this location that everyone's going to be jealous of. And I, I imagine, are you thinking about who this couple is as you're scouting out parts of nature in order Absolutely. to- Absolutely. Yeah. Understanding their connection. You're not just picking, oh, this is a great spot. I'm going to place them. You're no. picking a spot based on how you know the yeah. couple. Going over their notes from the questionnaire that we took when, we, when they hired us, yeah. bringing it on, all of their connection, understanding would it, the, you know, the real question is, would- what would the couple want to hang on their wall? Not do I think this is great or does Andy think this is great mm-hmm. or does whoever think this is the wedding planner think this is great, but does the couple hang this photo? Because if the couple will pay for it or mm-hmm. pay for you, that's the bottom line. doesn't matter what anybody else thinks because art is so subjective. It, I was going to ask you art about is that so part subjective. of it. Yeah. And, uh, and being self-taught, not to knock anybody that went to college for photography because I think Brooks was great and every, every photographer that came out of there, I'm sure they're amazing. But when you go to school for something, they teach you based on things they can assess. They teach you things they can it's test on. It's just technique. Yeah. They teach you things that they can test, but you can't test fine art. You can't test emotion. You can't test the ability, mm. you know, because it's completely subjective. What I like would be completely different than what you like. So it's a sense of intuitiveness for you, obviously. Yeah. It's a sense can't of- Can't explain it's it, It's a right? sense of the couple with- Oh, and how they move you yeah, in effect. Exactly. It's the couple's connection with me behind the camera, not me personally. Yes. But what I can do for them, getting them that photo is the most important thing to me. It's complete tunnel vision Mm -hmm. when I go to these places and being able to connect with them through the camera. There's another quote following from this. You say, when it comes to telling a live story between two people, the rules bend or even break. What do you mean by that? Absolutely. Oh my gosh, I couldn't have said it better. A lot of- You did say it. (laughs) A lot of the things that you- Feel with a couple when you put it into, how do I explain this? We've all seen images of a mom that takes a picture of her kid with her, with her point and shoot 
camera or cell phone and the head looks huge and the feet look tiny and it's all squampus and it right. it doesn't make sense. The rules don't apply, right? Because it's not how it looked. Uh-huh. You use those exact rules in your favor, right? It's it's the same exact thing with the positive, negative, with the vulnerability, with the openness, with the dark and the light. You're using the rules against the camera. So you're pushing the limits of the camera hmm. by understanding how the camera is going to react and then using that to create more light or more rays of light or more darkness or more depth. You use those things to turn that image upside down so that it plays it plays unfairly in your favor. Whoa. Rather interesting. Than, um, yeah. Rather than playing unfairly not in your favor, which would be the example of the mom with the point and shoot, uh-huh. right? So it's the exact same thing, but the opposite of it, juxtaposed mm-hmm. straight straight on, you know. So a lot of these things are simply, a lot of these images that, that you see on my website are, are simple camera tricks. It's just using the camera's abilities against it, if that makes any sense at all. No, I love what you're saying. I, I, love, I love this claim. So you are also traveling around the world for this. What is that experience like for you? It's amazing. It's, it's great. But you have to understand also that when you're doing this, it's not for the money, it's not fun and games. There is a huge responsibility that comes along with this, a massive responsibility. I have a wedding in South Africa in a, in a few weeks I'm looking forward to. It's going to be great. But the bride and groom, I, I really want to get them something super special. And we're doing a safari. We're trying to get wedding photos out there. Oh, we'll see how that cool. turns out. Yeah. But when you're traveling, it's not like, oh, this is going to be, I'm going to Bora Bora, Maldives, Seychelles, whatever. <laughs> right. the, when you land, you don't get to take off your, all your clothes and run naked on the beach. You <laughs> right. pick up a camera and you have to work. You yeah. study, you go to the lab, you put on your glasses, you open your laptop, you read the notes, you really read up. So when you're doing these destinations, a lot of time that can be more of a deterrent than if it were here in New York City. Huh. Because there's so much going on if you're in Lake Como or if you're in Santorini and you just want to play. Yeah. But you really need to concentrate and focus on your couple, what's going to be best for them. And so I think there's a lot of responsibility that goes along with it that can get overlooked. Well, also I'm thinking even for you to choose the physical environment by which you're going to choose and or going to shoot them. And again, you're matching up also how you know them and the connection and, and all of that. Are you therefore researching, like let's say you're going to go to Bora Bora, you're researching ahead of time, well, here are certain sites to go to. I mean, I, I don't know how you manage all of that. Yeah, a lot of it is playing into getting the couple the right shot that encapsulates their entire wedding in yeah. one photo. Yeah. It's the shot. You you want it to be perfect for them. And a lot of it is understanding the layout, but also why they chose this place to get married, right? Why they love each other, how they love each other. If they got married at the Four Seasons Thalasso in Bora Bora, or um, the Intercontinental Thalasso of the Four Seasons, or the St. Regis, they're all different. Why did they pick a different one? Was it based on the location? Uh, Was it based on this? So that informs what do they, you, obviously. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Thinking about, you know, especially when, when the, you bring the drone into it and you're shooting drone shots. A lot of the drone shots have a completely different perspective, hmm. but the couple didn't see that going in right? because they don't know what the drone looks like. So when you go and present the couple with a photo that you can get for them, you're like, look, this may not be your vision, but I can do this for you. Would you join me in this vision? Because mm. this is mine. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Do you ever have a couple, I, are, you must have couples that say no? Does oh, it happen yeah. much? Yeah. Uh, the biggest constraint typically is time. Mm-hmm. On a wedding day, there's a lot going on. As you know, 30,000 moving pieces. We want to make sure that that they get all the little bits that they want. The The bridesmaids, mom and dad, family photos, those are all absolutely vital. But getting the little extra shot takes effort. and And you literally get out of it what you put into it. You do. And I tell my couples, look, this is going to take an extra two hours because we have to drive to this location and do all this stuff. I promise you it will pay off, mm. but you're going to have to a lot for me on the most important day of your life. So there's a lot <laughs> right. of trust that goes on there yeah. because all these people have traveled from all over the world to be with them. And I want nothing more than for them to be with these people. But they also want this iconic photo because that's why they brought me on. So telling it like it's a trade off. Are you getting that photo with every job that you're doing? I, I mean, every single time? Every single time you try and get them something that they're going to love. And it's, again, it's art. So it's completely subjective. Ah, right. Okay. So when we're looking through a book or my website or whatever, there may be photos that you're absolutely in love with and you don't know how I shot it or whatever the case may be. But then there are other photos that you're like, oh yeah, it's a good shot. But maybe to that couple, it's the favorite photo on the website because yeah. it's theirs and yeah. it means something special to them. Yeah. And that kind of comes down to just being open and vulnerable with your couples and getting to know them, mm. trying to capture that. Earlier, you started to touch on light. 
you know, with mm-hmm. that particular picture. Can you tell me about the role of light in your photography? Like, I, and I know that, uh, like, your understanding of landscape photography, you have said in writing, affects your understanding of light. I would love to understand that more. Absolutely. That is a phenomenal question. I feel like when it comes to weddings, there are not a lot of fine art photographers in the wedding industry. And I, I don't mean that to, to rag on people that say they're fine art photographers, but to me, fine art is being able to capture the essence or beauty of one thing in one photo. And so understanding landscapes and capturing the art and beauty of a location Mm -hmm. in one photo, you only have one shot. People don't want to hang 30,000 images in their wall. But if you can understand that and translate that into a living, breathing event that is a wedding, then you bring the light over. And so hopefully when you're looking at the images, they look vibrant, they look dreamy, they look ethereal, there's more light in them. I use light rays a lot, and those are all real. There's landscape tricks that I use to get in more light or to block out more light. The more light you have, I don't know if we want to get into this too much. I definitely want to. Okay. Well, <laughs> I know there are people listening who want to hear this. Your eye can see a lot of stops, and a stop is basically a third of light. Okay. But when it's really, really dark or really, really bright, uh-huh. your eye turns to black and white. I'm sure you've seen that when you're driving down the highway and it's been raining and the oh, sun's yes, in your face yes, yes. and it's super bright and dark and all you can see is black That's, and white. I've the never in front of thought you, about it, but the color disappears, yes, right? Absolutely. Same thing in the middle of the night. You go to the bathroom. I don't know if you've ever noticed. The lights are off. All you're seeing is black it's and white. Black. You're not yeah, seeing yeah. color. Color comes in. Color is a very, very finicky thing. Yeah. And it comes in only when you allow it, only when there's enough light for your rods and cones to react to it. It's the same thing with photography, just on a smaller scale, because the camera's sensor is not as sensitive as your eyes. So you can use that to your advantage. Again, those tricks that that you can play on the camera Mm -hmm. to either get more color and more saturation in or less by letting in more or less light. This is so fascinating to me. And I know you also said, uh, supporting what you said, color, you said this color and light are both important tools in telling a story. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. I, there are so many ways that you can approach a wedding and tell the couple's story with the lens, with the aperture. We, we shoot with a, a highly specialized lens. It's a Canon 50 millimeter F1.0. There's no photographer out there that shoots with it. It's an antique lens, hasn't been made in 30 years, uh, but it opens up wider at 1.0 than any other lens does. And it was for a long time, it was the, um, the holy grail of lenses. And People that review lenses have said it's the best lens they've ever tested, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. It's very hard to get your hands on and very expensive, but we use that lens to let in more light, but you can also control a lot of things when you're looking at an image. When you shoot an image, you can control a lot of things using that lens. So you can control where people look, when they look, right? So, so are you looking at the couple first or are you oh, looking at the landscape first? Yeah. Because what's in focus, what's dark, what's light. Yes. When you can control what people look at, you can control what people feel when they're looking at this the image. exactly like a painting. That's what a exactly. painter does. Yeah, exactly. So you're creating this piece of art by using tricks within the camera mm. and in the lens and, and with light by understanding if I shoot this too bright, it's going to be black and white. Is that okay? What's the couple going to think? What's it going to look like? Are they going to be too dark? Are they going to have enough saturation? All of these questions. I could talk all day about this. I, I could listen all day. <laughs> no, I, I love what we're getting here, Clint. What, what are some of your, so uh, all that you've done, I, I mean, I look at the pictures, I think I'll, I'll take any one of those. What are some of your favorite, favorite, favorite events and moments? That is an awesome question, Andy. I feel like some of my favorite images happen instantly without expectation. Ooh, I like that. Which is really interesting. I, a long time ago, I heard a quote, good things take time, great things happen instantly. And yeah. that may or may not be true, but in my case, especially as a photographer, for instance, there's an image that I shot. I'm, I'm holding it open. We can put it on the website. But this was shot in a parking lot. In a parking this lot? This was shot in a parking lot. Can you lot. describe it so yeah, people can yeah. look so for it? It's the couple and it's snowing and there's snow yeah, all over. Yeah, I was going to say it looks yeah. like snow. Yeah, it looks like they're in a snow globe. And they're facing each other. Yeah, yeah it looks like they're in a snow globe. And that's in a parking it's lot. It's in a parking lot. That's we're right crazy. next to the valet. Crazy. Like, there, there were cars everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And we were crossing because the reception was in one building and the, the ceremony was in another. So uh-huh. we were crossing the parking lot because there was no underground. Okay. We had to get across, but it was snowing. Yeah. And I said, hold still. I see something. Just, just follow me on this. It was freezing. The bride was not too happy. I said, I promise this will be worth it. <laughs> bam. One, one shot. Yeah. That's it. We didn't that was it. take two. She was not in the mood for two. One photo, <laughs> bam. And we hit it. And I got very lucky. So to answer your question, I feel like some of my favorite photos happen all at once. And it really is just based on the couple. Mm. What about challenges? What are some of the greatest challenges that you've had to face? 
a lot. <laughs> A lot of yeah, it you're is, almost the way you do this. You're setting yourself up for nothing but challenges. Oh my! It's God. true. It's it's really hard, and that's what turns it into fine art, right? Is encapsulating something in one photo. I feel like some of my biggest challenges, though, are with what you don't see in the photo. A lot of my biggest challenges are with the connection. That's really really hard to get, especially yeah. when you're repeating it a couple times a month, right? A couple weddings a month, mm. really understanding your couple and trying to really get inside their head can be hard, especially if the brides or groom is finicky and they see these amazing photos on your website, or they think they're amazing. And like, I want this, I want this. It's like, okay, but this takes work. This takes work. So sometimes you face challenges where you leave a wedding and you weren't able to, to quite get exactly what the couple wanted, especially if they're trying to replicate a shot that you've already got, uh -huh. like on the Brooklyn Bridge or whatever mm -hmm. the case may be. They're like, I want this. And you go try and shoot it, and it just doesn't work. The weather didn't work out, the sunset, whatever the case may be. So a lot of times it's just setting and managing correct expectations of like, look, we will try our best to get this, but it doesn't turn out that way all the time. And sometimes you're not expecting anything, and something absolutely amazing turns out. So it's, it's a crapshoot. Yeah. What about also, Clayton, I mean, you know, we talked about this before we hit the record button. There are artists out there. And for me, I think of musicians. I was saying to you, there's probably four more Stevie Wonders out there, but because they don't have the business aspect together, we're not going to know about them. Yeah. You are also running a business. You know, how do you, the, the juxtaposition of, of business, which is considered technically non-creative and then creative, whereas I'm sure you've heard this. As a matter of fact, I've heard it was uh, Brian Raffanelli and David Stark talked about the, cre the creativity of business. If you look at it, that it is a creative act conducting business. Right. And so like Brian says, he, he loves the business as much as the artistry. I don't know if I can say that for myself. It's why I've, I have a business partner now. <laughs> but then also David Stark was saying the act of creating a uh, business structure, that is an ultimate creative act. How are you looking at the business aspect of what you do? That's an interesting question. These are the business is very finite. The business is very confined because their business rules have already been set out. People can do this over and over again. You come up with a business idea, you try and replicate. It's been done a million times. Business is business, but it's really hard when you're when you're playing with emotions, when you're playing mm. with something of so much responsibility and importance. Mm -hmm. The business was that's my background. And so I feel like I feel like I could own a ketchup store or a cafe or make sandwiches on the side of the road. And I could be successful because it's a business. Yeah. You're just running a business. Yeah. It's, it's not hard. There's, there's set up ways, you know, to go about all this stuff, but to really get into weddings, it takes, you have to sh love and you have to want to share that love with people. Ah, oh, that's an interesting way to put it. You know, I, I know too that you're, uh, relatively speaking, you're starting to scale in the sense that you've brought on, what, like five photographers who mm -hmm. now work for you? Can you tell yeah. me about that? That's a big change. What led you to do that? Yeah. Uh, there is a lot of talent, a lot of talent in New York. Not There's not in San Francisco. I love my San Francisco friends. But in New York, there's there's the opportunity to really, truly nurture and grow people that are from Ivy League classes. Some of my, two of my girls are um, in the medical field. One has a degree from Duke. Another one is an actual PhD, hated it, <laughs> decided she didn't want to do medicine anymore. So wow. she left, wants to do photography That's great. full time. Yeah. These people are insanely smart and insanely talented mm. in their own field. And these are the people that I want to work with. These are the people that I want to grow and nurture. These are the people that I want to grow with because they're in it for the right reasons. They're in it because they've succeeded elsewhere. They know exactly what it's like in the world out there. And sometimes it's not that pretty. So to be able to be an artist and share what you love, that's that's a true responsibility like we've been talking about. Yeah, but it's, yeah. also, it's also something I don't take lightly. And so I'm working with people that understand, hey, there's a world out there that we could be successful at. We choose to do this. We choose to share this day with mm -hmm. our couples. This is, you know, this is kind of how you grow the business is you take those people and you nurture them based on attitude, based on talent. Yeah. And and you go from there, right? You know this. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely, <laughs> I'm thinking a lot about my own situation with that kind of thing. How are you dealing with uh, social media? I mean, especially being a photographer, how do you feel about social media? Yeah, it's a... Uh, Social media is a is a fastidious beast, right? There's <laughs> I haven't heard anyone say that yet. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot out there. Uh, social media is something that you have to 
manage. You have to be out there, especially if you're an artist and you're mm-hmm. self-employed. You absolutely have to have a social media presence. But you also need to be really careful when you're doing that because you want people to understand the authenticity behind it. Uh-huh. You want people to understand that behind each image is an actual couple that's actually in love. Hmm. There's This is a piece of art. It's an art piece, but there's actually a photographer. You need to draw that connection across. And that can be really hard to do when you're so impersonal on social media because you go online and you can scroll through your Instagram feed. You see 50 good pictures. You don't even look at who that shot it. You're, yeah. You mm-hmm. don't even look at, you don't even look at what went into it, which is, which is great because you can produce great art uh-huh. without being accredited for it. I'm not in it for the credit, but at the same time, you have to be really careful because creating these pieces of art, you're actually telling a story. This is not something that, that somebody just scrolls through. This is somebody, this is somebody's life. This is the best day of these people's lives. You really want them to, to encapture, to encapsulate that. You know, I also want to move into networking. You know, we yeah. were talking a little about this. I, I believe I met you first time I met you in person was at uh, an engaged conference. Yep. And that is such a critical piece for all of us, yet it's also challenging. You know, just generally speaking, how do you approach networking? That's a great question. I like to network with people that understand what we do here in mm-hmm. the industry. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's, it's more of a responsibility than it is a job, in my mind. And a lot of people get it. There are some great names that I could throw out there. I know everyone's listened to them, but they understand that this is not, it is a job, but it's it's more so the opportunity to really uh, connect with people. And it's it's a huge, you don't do this for money. And so when I network, I, I like to go with these people that are truly authentic and in it for the right reasons. Mm. There's a lot of names I could throw out there, but I'll say Jess Gordon. I know yep, you know she Jess. Was on the show, sure. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorites, just because of uh, of who she is, she's true to herself. She's uh-huh. authentic. Yeah, and she's she does this because she absolutely loves. Could you imagine what Jess would do if she didn't do right? Like she's I, I a visionary. Know. And, and if, if if any of you have a chance to hear Jess speak, it's uh, I, I'm not going to say why, but uh, well, it's an experience. <laughs> so and, I'm sorry, I digress. But to, and no. I love you, Jess. But to answer your question. When I go into a networking f- a networking event, it's always very exciting for me, especially at Engage, because it tends to be the melding of the minds of some of the top people in yes. the industry. There are a lot of top people out there that that you don't necessarily meet at Engage, but it is right. a great melting pot for some of the top minds. So going into it, my approach to networking is to try and find authentic people that really connect with yes. their job, with the couple, and with you. Those are the people that I, I, and I look at each one of those as kind of like a golden nugget, right? Like these people are awesome. They're, they're genuine and they're real and they're doing this for all the right reasons, the, the reasons that you would want if you were getting married and you that's were hiring right. somebody. And so going into it, that's kind of what I look for when I'm networking. And th- there's so many out there. There's so many great people out there that are and, incredible. And you know what kind of, I'm thinking when you're speaking about this, in my early days, I would target. I mean, I, I, Wow, I oh, would absolutely. I would take a look at, at at a minimum. You know, who are the speakers? What are yeah. they doing? Who do I want to meet? You know, if I hear about right. any certain attendees, and I'd go and I, you know, I got to meet this person, that person, yeah. this person. The pressure was terrible. Oh my gosh! Oh my god! Yeah, Preston Bailey's here. Marcy <laughs> Bloom is here. I need to meet yeah, them. Well, I could be prepared to say so. What am I going to yeah. say to them? And then I, I remember I was on a shuttle. Actually, it was an Engage conference, um, and I was starting to realize this more and more. But I was on a shuttle with somebody who later became a, a good friend of mine. Um, it was a was long it shuttle. Yes, it was, it was the Banff. Calgary shuttle. I know yes, who you're talking two about. Two hours. Yeah. Long, oh, I've talked about it on the show. And so we were talking about the whole aspect of networking, and and I had been kind of in the middle. I had some targeting and some just want to meet people and really have it be genuine. He was saying he has zero objectives at all he just goes has fun just simply wants to connect with people and he has gotten so much more business ever since he yeah, made that he's an awesome guy by the way and he's here in new york we're talking about andre i love andre uh <laughs> absolutely awesome andre guy Mayer. and yes he does and he, i think he he approaches life the right way without expectations i don't want to speak for andre but he goes into it just for the love of it yes right? and that's the reason to do it that's why we're all here yeah. It, I love Andre. It, it's really so so Clay, last question here. I'm gonna give you a tough one. How do you define success for yourself? Oh my God. Andy, these are awesome questions. All right. Yeah, hey. you'd think you'd do this for a living or something. <laughs> uh, 
Success is being able, I, I feel so honestly, Andy, I feel so blessed to do this every day to meet people like you uh, because we are in a selective industry. People want to do what we do all over the world. We travel, we take mm-hmm. pictures for a living and, mm-hmm. and we, we do events. We, we're with, there's love, there's celebration. Oftentimes there's a lot of money in these things. And, and it looks from the, the outside to be very glamorous. It does, right. It really does. To me, success is simply being able to do this year after year after year with mm-hmm. the people that I love in the industry and my couples both and mm-hmm. my my studio. Everybody in the industry I love that I've worked with for the most part. Mm. And success to me is just that, waking up, right? Waking up with a future, with a hope, with a something to look forward to of like, oh my God, I got this awesome wedding next year. And, you know, David beams on the flowers or Mindy's doing this one or whatever the case may be, Colin, da, 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 da. being able to work with the people that you want to work with and people that allow you to connect and create in, in the way that your soul strives for. That to me is success, regardless of money. I'd do it for free, just for the ability to really, really be able to express myself yes. and and touch other people and give these couples that gift. Man, Andy, when when a couple opens our album and they see those photos that you shot and tears are streaming down their face, mm-hmm. there is no amount of money in my bank account that matters to me. All I care about is this couple right there. It's the best feeling in the whole world. Whew. Thank you, Clayton, for being on the show. This was wonderful, wonderful. Absolutely. It was a wonderful experience for me. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you for listening to my interview of Clayton Gessel. Check out his website at ClayneGessel.com. That's C-L-A-N-E-G-E-S-S-E-L, ClayneGessel.com. His social media handle is also Clayne Gessel. It's all in the show notes at TheWeddingBiz.com. And please be sure to share this uh, with your friends and colleagues and even outside of the industry. Clearly, this was an episode that so many people, uh, just being human, can benefit from. And don't forget to listen to our follow-on segment with each interview, The Next Level, in which I have a guest co-host and together we tease out some of the highlights of the interview and talk about them in a way that you can use to elevate your own business to another level. And this week's guest co-host is going to be Sean Lowe of The Business of Being Creative. Uh, Sean has been on the show many times and, and just contributes so much. So be sure to subscribe on your podcast cell phone app so you get notifications when new episodes come out. And again, go to our website, theweddingbiz.com, where the show notes are. And also follow us on Instagram at The Wedding Biz. And so we will catch you next week on The Wedding Biz. Wedding Biz.